thank you so much for joining us on the dwelling show i'm your host Ola dantes i've got an incredible guest with us today chad griffins hey chad how you doing hey Ola. thanks so much for having me on the show my absolute pleasure um i always love to to talk shop so yeah can't can't wait um yeah let's let's jump right into it just tell our listeners who chad is and what you've been doing and kind of what you've been um up to lately actually yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm an industrial real estate broker and an investor. I got started in the industry in 2005. I've actually been at the same company for, for that whole time. So I guess we're coming on 17 years now. I started investing myself in 2014. And with a series of partners, uh, different partners and different projects, uh, we've been essentially buying a property every year, uh, starting with a really small industrial condo, uh, and then moving up to to some larger projects that we've closed on uh, recently. So I uh, spend most of my time still as an active uh, broker, working with uh, tenants, landlords, buyers, sellers of industrial real estate. Uh, and then in my spare time, I, I run a relatively decent sized investment portfolio as well. Yeah, thanks for that intro. I really appreciate it. And you are out of, um, you know, Canada, so I'm in. Yeah, yeah. I'm in Canada. The, the the reference that I usually use now is uh, is if anybody watches Yellowstone and they <laughs> follow along with the the Dutton family ranch, I'm straight north of the Dutton family ranch. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, I haven't yeah. seen that show, but I I do know of it. Yeah, somewhere. it's worth watching. It's oh, really? it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Cool. Well, you've mentioned a couple of things I want to touch on. Um, most brokers that I deal with, um, yeah, I'll say most actually, I'm in the multifamily space, uh, you know, they sell real estate, help you buy real estate, but usually never invest. So what made you, you know, kind of start investing? I mean, I'm sure you were doing pretty well as a broker. Why did you, you know, go into the investing side of things? Yeah, I've always had a, an itch to be an investor, even before getting into the industry in 2005. I had bought and sold a few houses with some friends and made a little bit of money doing it, but not a whole lot. Uh, when I got into industrial real estate, I just saw an awesome investment vehicle where there's uh, it flew under the radar. There's not a lot of people pursuing it. There were some really good returns, stable income. Tenants can stay in a building for 10, 20 years. And if you know that market really well, you can capitalize on it. So I, I knew right away that within the first year or two of being as, in a, as a broker, I knew right away that I wanted to start investing in industrial. And it just, it took some time to save up enough money to do it. And I was raising a family and buying a house and wanting to do all the things that come with a family. So it just took me some time to save up enough to, to have an adequate amount of capital to, to invest. And I, I'm very grateful that I did because it's, it's something that I follow every day. And I think that that, that may perhaps is, is one of the th reasons that I'm so interested in being an investor in the space is that I, I follow this all day, every day. It's what I do for a living is follow trends, what's happening in the space, what's tenant demand, what are tenants looking for in different types of properties, what are properties selling for. I just had a really good understanding of what the market was. So I wanted to, use that and leverage that knowledge and continuing knowledge. Like it's not even just something that I learn once and then put it to the shelf. I'm actively studying the market every day. So I just figured if I can leverage that into my own investments, then given enough time and, and some smart decisions and a little bit of luck, it should work out pretty well. So uh, I knew I wanted to be an investor in the space very early on. And uh, I'm very glad that I have. Yeah, no, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, yeah, quite refreshing to see <laughs> a broker actually uh, really getting into, into this. Um, so kind of a good segue of you actually getting into um, the investing side of things. You mentioned that you had partners and, you know, partners can, can make or break you. Um, I like to always touch on that. Um, for somebody listening, maybe, you know, they want to do single family, multifamily, whatever, maybe even industrial, you know, when you were choosing your partners, how did you make that decision? And what would you say we should look out for um, when we're trying to get into bed um, or a business perspective, obviously, with someone? Great topic, Ola. And, and I'm glad that you do bring that up. And I'm glad that that's a, a theme of, of the discussions that you have with investors, because it's, it's a complicated and and 
it's a, it's a complex topic. And for people that just think, well, I don't want to have partners because then there's more decision makers. And if something goes wrong, then I've got all the issues and problems that come with that. And there's certainly an element of, of that type of risk that comes anytime you bring a partner into it. So my, I'll speak just for myself, my own experiences on it. And, and I think people might be able to infer how I would recommend someone per, uh, pursue this. So the partner that I have, and I've got one partner on every single property that I own, uh, the same guy, and we've got a few partner, a few properties where it's just him and I, and then we've got a few properties where we've opened it up to other investors. So it's, but he's, he's along the ride on everything that I do. We're, we're business partners in our, in our company and we're partners in the properties that we have. And him and I had very similar strategic long-term goals about being long-term investors. And I think that that would be of critical importance is to whoever you partner with is to make sure that somebody has a similar type of vision. Uh, for him and I, we just work really well, but we both started investing relatively young age-wise. And our objective was thinking 15 to 20 years out. And we figured given enough time, it's hard to make money and it's hard to lose money in real estate if you have enough time on your side. So we both took a long-term approach on it. We weren't trying to flip properties. We weren't trying to go in and make a quick buck. We just thought, let's buy the right property. Let's make sure it's stabilized. Let's do an, a, a great job of managing it. And let's just hold on for dear life, essentially. At least that was the mentality with the first one is let's, let's just hold on for dear life. And we've been fortunate. We've been able to leverage some of the funds that we've had and buy the properties, but that first one was a bit nerve wracking, but I, th but I think the key was that we had similar objectives. So we both were thinking long-term with it. And that was in 2014, we bought that first property. We actually still have that property and it's done very well for us. Uh, but I think having a similar objective is key. And I think having somebody that shares a similar type of mindset on, on how, problem solving, coming up with a strategy as opposed to perhaps overreacting or rushing a decision if something doesn't go right. I think you need to treat it that there's always going to be a wrinkle when you own real estate. There's always a wrinkle in the road. Uh, it could be a tenant leaves on you. It could be the bank doesn't give you the refinancing terms that you want. There's always going to be a wrinkle at some point in the ownership perhaps multiple points in the ownership. And you need to have somebody that that is prepared to iron out those wrinkles with you along the way, as opposed to uh, panicking and perhaps making a poor decision. And those, I think, are the relationships where people get into trouble if they bring on a partner that perhaps is just a capital partner. They're, they're maybe not bringing anything else to the table beyond capital. And then if something goes wrong, then they might panic. They might want access to their capital. That creates a whole domino effect of stress. Whereas if the objectives are clear between you and any JV partners that you're doing at front that, okay, we've got a, we've got a goal in sight. This could be 10 years down the road. It could be 20 years down the road. It could even be a year down the road, theoretically, but everybody's on the same page of what they're trying to achieve. And there's some commonality and some idea that we'll persevere through this, even if there is problems and setbacks. I think that'd be the, the biggest recommendation that I would have. And I, I think that that extends even beyond just having a single partner, a one property that we have, I believe we have nine investors total in on that one. And uh, my partner and I are both equity partners in it. So we, do, it wasn't necessarily a syndicate where we, we raised money and we were just the GPs and we took a lift without having to contribute to ourselves. We're equity partners in every property that we have. And we've strategically picked all of our partners for the exact same reason that we want them to have similar types of ob objectives. And, and I can, I can appreciate people that are stressed out about the idea of having partners. If they start hearing a story about a, uh, a guy, perhaps he went out and raised money from a number of different partners that he perhaps didn't know uh, in an, like an LP position, raised a bunch of money. And then uh, something happened and then he was getting phone calls from people that needed to cash out or wanted to influence his decisions on whether he kept the property or sold it or whatever. That would be a very stressful situation versus what we've done is we know all of the investors that we have alongside us very well. They're either close friends or family. And we've been very clear and upfront what our strategy is, 
what the exit strategy is, how long we expect to hold this for. And they're, they all have a degree of comfort in us because we have a track record of doing this as well. So I, I would, I, I think a partner is at least one partner is of huge benefit from the standpoint that you have somebody that's perhaps checking any blind spots that you have. They, they're bringing something to the table that you might not have. Uh, as an example, we have an appraiser, uh, a commercial appraiser on one of our properties, and he just has a lot of insight that we don't have ourselves. So if, if you can find strategic partners that bring something to the table, protect your blind spots, also bring some capital and have a similar type of objection, uh, objective, I think it's much easier moving forward as a team, as opposed to trying to do it individually. Terrific. Really, really love that. Um, thanks for that, that answer. Um, so for somebody who has never heard of industrial, or maybe they're just listening to this, you know, this is their first episode in, in you know, my, of my podcast and they're like, what is industrial? <laughs> well, what do you say to that? So maybe that's, you know, the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is, can you talk about your, your first deal? And you mentioned it was a small industrial condo. So maybe kind of, you know, um, tackle those two questions, kind of give us an idea. Yeah, and great point. It's uh, a lot of people don't have uh, much familiarity with industrial real estate, and nor should the average person have a need to know about industrial real estate, uh, unless someone's worked at, at a factory or a warehouse as a job, or they knew somebody that worked in a, in a building, there really isn't much of a reason for people to know about industrial real estate. It's not taught in school. It's barely even taught in any real estate programs. So there isn't much of a need for it, but it, it's a massive, massive industry. There was a study done a couple of years ago, which uh, surveyed the entire US landscape for industrial real estate. And there's about 20 billion square feet worth of industrial real estate in the US and the aggregate value is about $1.5 trillion. So it's this massive industry that like you said, a, a lot of people just don't really know about. So I, I like to group industrial real estate into three categories just because there is overlap, but there certainly is some differences. So the first one is warehouses. And I'm sure you've got these all over Houston, uh, definitely all over Texas. I know of a few going up in, in Dallas, but these are like the big Amazon fulfillment centers or just big distribution centers. And the whole purpose of these is they, they either store product or they're repackaging product. Something comes in, it's sorted, stored, something happens to that product and then it gets shipped out. So these are really high ceilings. There's semi-trailers going all the time back and forth in them. These are the ones that are a lot more common now where, where people see these on just off the highway now. Uh, and that can be anywhere from a 2 million square foot Amazon facility all the way down to a 5,000 square foot little bay where a small company just brings in, call it groceries. They bring in small groceries and then they, they ship it out. So that covers a full spectrum of size for warehouses. The other one, which is often tucked away in deep in an industrial park and, and people just wouldn't have any reason to, to be familiar with these are manufacturing properties. So these are all the, all the properties where raw material will come in, it'll be assembled or manufactured or produced or compiled. Something happens with that raw product so that it turns into either a semi-finished good or a finished good, and then it gets shipped out to the next stop in the destination. So if it's a semi-finished product, it might go to another manufacturer to have a new component added to it. If it's a finished good, it could go to a warehouse, it could go to a, a retailer, it could get shipped right to somebody's house. Those manufacturing properties are what make up a considerable amount of the industrial landscape, but it's just not common. Like I said, and I, I know I sound repetitious on that, but uh, there's, there's really no reason for someone to be in a manufacturing building or to even know about it unless they happen to work in one. Uh, but that makes those two sectors, the warehousing and manufacturing make up the bulk of the industrial landscape. And then the third one is uh, flex properties. And that's sort of a catch all term, which, which is meant to describe all the properties that are zoned or regulated for industrial types of use. So Houston is an example, they will permit certain uses uh, to be allowed in buildings. And they'll, uh, I, I don't know Houston's classification well by any means, but uh, they'll likely have a classification just for industrial zone properties. So the property will have an industrial designation, and then there'll be a whole bunch of assorted uses that can go in there. And a flex property is used to describe all these buildings, which are 
zoned reg or regulated industrial, but aren't necessarily compatible for warehousing or manufacturing. And you'll see a ton of this. I bet you even, even in downtown Houston, you will have older industrial buildings that might have been built 100 years ago that have since been retrofitted into other types of uses. Uh, so they'll still have an industrial zoning on them, uh, but they'll just be a, a, an unconventional use. So you might see a car dealership. Uh, some churches can even go into industrial zone buildings. You might see uh, an art gallery a brewery, all types of different uses can fit into that flex category. So you can almost view it as, as kind of like that miscellaneous category for everything that's not neatly manufacturing or warehousing. Fantastic. I really, really love that um, breakdown. I was just taking some notes. So let's jump into this um, small industrial condo that you bought. How did you find the deal? How did you fund the deal? And I, I know you said you're still, you're still, you know, holding that deal. So how is it going? Yeah, so it was actually a client of mine at the time who wanted to sell or lease the property. So it's a 2000 square foot, uh, you could almost call it a flex property, uh, because it's, it is compatible for a number of different uses. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell a couple just to share how, how broad industrial categories can be. Uh, but as a 2000 square foot industrial condo, uh, my client wanted to sell or uh, lease it. And I ended up finding a, a kitchen repair company that wanted to lease it. So their, their business was essentially anytime a restaurant had a stove breakdown or a fridge breakdown or any piece of kitchen equipment, they would be dispatched to go and try and fix it. And if they couldn't repair it on site, they'd bring it back to their shop and replace parts or do whatever they could with it. Uh, and they wanted to lease it. So they entered into a lease. Uh, after we had the lease completed, I asked the seller if he still wanted to sell it. And he said that he did. So I made an arrangement with him to, uh, to essentially buy it, uh, with that new tenant going into it. So it worked out really well for us that, that we didn't have to buy a vacant space. We already had a tenant going into it. Uh, he got a price that he was happy with, uh, that he wanted to sell it for. And we got a tenant in there. So, uh, that was, I guess that was seven years ago or so. The kitchen equipment company was in there for five years. Uh, and they left about two years ago. And then we've since put in a machine shop. So kind of, kind of like CNC and lathes and different type of heavy manufacturing uh, uses that go in there. Uh, even though that, that space could theoretically be used for warehousing, we've got a manufacturing type of tenant in there. So I, I would call that one a pretty pretty good representation of a flex property. Uh, but the, the beautiful thing about that little condo bay, it's the smallest one that we own uh, uh, right now, but it's been very hands off uh, with the exception of having to go and fix a few things here and there. I bet in the last seven years, I've been at that property less than a dozen times. Uh, I, whereas can you imagine having like a, a multifamily property or even a single family house, how many times you'd be at that property over the course of seven years? A lot of times I can tell you, I own a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you know, firsthand. <laughs> so, um, so triple net leases, right? Is this building, yep. um, a triple net lease building? I'm guessing it is. And if so, what is it a is. triple net lease for somebody who's never heard of any of these things we're talking about? Yeah. And in my mind, that's, that's probably one of the major benefits, if not the best benefit of owning industrial or commercial real estate for that matter, such as an office or retail, is that the leases are structured, like you said, in a triple net basis. So the terminology can vary across markets. Uh, triple net's common to say, but you can hear fully net, you might hear single net or double net or uh, net, net, net. You hear all types of different terminology, but the whole essence of having a a lease structured that way is that there's two amounts that you're going to charge a tenant. The first amount is your net rent. So that could sometimes be called triple net again, but you're charging them a net rent. So that's one amount that they pay to you as the landlord. Then you also charge them a additional rent or operating cost. And again, that terminology can vary. So depending on where you're listening to this, you might want to just check your local market to see how they, how they describe it. But whatever it's called, the intent is the same. Those operating costs or additional rent, that's your proportionate share of property taxes, building insurance, common area maintenance, such as landscaping, snow removal where I'm at, which you don't have a problem with in Houston, uh, and even management fees. So those, that operating cost covers the tenant's proportionate share of all those expenses. So if it's just one tenant in the building, that the, they pay 100% of the operating costs. If there's four tenants in there and they each occupy the same amount, they'll pay 25% being their proportionate share of those operating costs. And the beauty of a, of a 
properly structured net lease is that you'll know what that net rent is for the term of the lease. So that'll be a contracted rent that's agreed to by both parties and the tenants will agree to pay it. And that, that could be a flat rate. So call it $10 a square foot over the lease, or it can be, it can have escalations in there. So maybe it starts at $10, maybe it gets to $14, $15 by year five. You can have any amount agreed upon on there, as, but it's agreed up front. With the additional rent or the operating costs, any increases in those expenses get passed through to the tenant. So the beauty of, of how commercial leases are structured is that you don't have to worry about increases in those expenses eroding your profit as a landlord, because any increase in property taxes, if property taxes go up 10% next year, that increase gets passed through fully to the tenant. So you'll know what your net rent is for the, for the entire term of the lease. And you'll also know that if there's any increases, and especially if you're holding, you can imagine a 10 year lease. If you had a huge increase in property taxes or, or uh, landscaping or build insurance uh, skyrocketed, if you didn't have a triple net lease, you have no idea what your net rent is actually going to be by year 10. Whereas a properly structured net 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 lease, you're going to know that your net rent is the exact same. So you're going to know what you can use to service your debt. You're going to know how much you have left over that you can invest in other things or use for your own discretionary cash flow. And you're going to know that any increases in your operating expenses, your, your building operating expenses get passed through to the tenants. So in my mind, that, that just gives a whole lot of comfort versus doing a residential lease, which are often quoted on a gross basis. So you might charge, call it $2,000 a month for a tenant. And, and maybe that maybe that's a high number, maybe it's $1,000. So let's say you, you're uh, charging $1,000 a month, that's inclusive of your property taxes, your building insurance, your management fees, they'll probably pay utilities on top of that. But that will happen in a commercial or, or industrial lease as well. But a residential lease is often a gross lease, you're not charging them net rent plus passing any expenses through if property taxes go up, you might be able to raise the rent. Sometimes if Provided you're not in an area which has strict rent control, uh, but in commercial or industrial, there's no there's no rent control. So you've got the ability to lock in what your net rent is going to be for the term of the lease and not have to worry about your your profit or your residual cash flow being eroded because there's an increase that you didn't foresee. So you mentioned that um, you kind of you know you've got your finger on the pulse of the market, um, state of the market. Um, you know, of course, with COVID-19 and then now the Omicron variant just continue to ravage, you know, the global markets and just real estate as well is no exception to that. What are you seeing and, you know, how are this um, kind of this new mega Amazon big boxes, as they called, um, how is that mm -hmm. affecting, you know, the industrial market um, just in North America? It's, it's actually pretty crazy. It's and and I'm sure you're hearing this too, Ola, on, on just in in Houston, about how people are talking about supply chain disruptions and, and getting product to the market, you've probably experienced some shortages of material uh, in Houston, I know there is in Texas, there, there's all over the world right now is a face is facing supply chain issues. And what that is a result of is that this pandemic has shifted consumer pat buying patterns much quicker than was previously projected for e-commerce. And e-commerce has been taking away market share from traditional bricks and mortar retailers for years now, like decades. You can really go back to uh, uh, the Amazon effect of Amazon starting to uh, proliferate all this e-commerce and buying things on your computer and having to ship to your front door. This this goes back a lot longer than COVID. But what COVID did is it now took all those people that were comfortable still going to bricks and mortar stores. Uh, an example would be someone elderly, right? Someone elderly might not be up to date on technology. That's a poor generalization because my grandpa is actually the smartest uh, technology guy that I know. He knows more, way more about technology than I do. So I, I apologize if anyone's listening, they got offended by that. Uh, but call it an elderly person that that what didn't have that technological savvy, didn't want to learn how to go on to e-commerce and enter the credit cards and didn't feel comfortable with it on, and how they actually got it. So they did all their shopping in a traditional bricks and mortar store. I know that a lot of people technologically savvy or not 
transition to e-commerce over the past two years, sometimes as a result of stores being physically closed, there's that period of time where they're actually closed and people had no other choice. So it greatly accelerated that that trajectory of people buying things online. And we're starting to see some massive bottlenecks come from this over the past two years. And you guys are in inland market, just, just like Texas or just like Dallas and San Antonio, you're an inland market, but you're still, even Texas right now is running into shortages of high quality distribution space. And there's millions and millions of square feet of new space under development to try and get ahead of this surge in demand that there's all types of delays in even getting materials for the same reason that people have a hard time getting groceries or uh, bikes or things like that. People, uh, builders and developers are having a hard time getting material. So there's this huge push to develop industrial real estate all over the world, but it's going to take time to do it. And in the meantime, we're seeing severe shortages of quality industrial space all over the world. And a couple of markets that I'll point to as an example, uh, uh, California, and there's there's basically five deep water ports on the Pacific coast, uh, going from uh, Long Beach all the way up to the, to the border. There's five deep water ports. Two of those are actually in, in the greater Los Angeles region. And those two ports account for 40% of all goods being brought into North America. So 40% of everything that comes into North America from Asia or European uh, countries comes into that port, 40%, so like a crazy number. And the, the warehouse space in the greater LA and inland market is under 1%. So if you can imagine a less than 1% vacancy rate, it's that you're essentially, you're essentially no vacancy because that's just accounting for pockets that might come available and then are quickly snapped up. There's very, very hard time for companies trying to actually lease space in these super tight markets. And even inland markets like, like yours in, in Houston and mine uh, in Canada, we're, we're a landlocked market. Our vacancy rate for uh, high quality distribution space is also declining and it's pushing up rates. And I think this will all manifest itself into a few things in 2022. And it's, it's things that I'm going to be following pretty closely. I think we're still going to have a lot of inflationary pressure, uh, which, which we're seeing, right? Like we're seeing uh, multi-decade high highs for inflation right now. And I also think it's going to still have a lot of problems on supply chain. So I wouldn't be surprised if we come into the spring here and uh, you guys have kind of the similar year round weather, but in, in other markets where it, where it's more seasonal, there's going to be a big pickup in, in bikes and, and spring and summer activities. I think we're going to see a lot of demand on that as people can get outside again. And I, I could see us having supply chain issues for all of 2022. I just, I, I don't see much on the horizon short of a, like a global economic collapse or some geopolitical risk that I can't see. I don't see a uh, much plausible, uh, or at least anything that it can be predicted, uh, disrupting that anytime soon. So I think we're going to still see, uh, pressure on, on vacancy rates, upward pressure on rental rates and supply chain issues here in 2022. I mean, we can keep going on and on, but we're definitely, definitely dwelling into the quick <laughs> rounds. These are going to be quick questions, quick answers. Shoot. Yep. Awesome. First question, what makes you, Chad, unique? What is that differentiating factor that separates you from the next guy, from the next girl? I, I know this is lightning round, so I'll try to go quick. I think instead of unique, I think I'm just weird uh, and weird in, in a fascinating way where I just, I, I do a lot of weird things. Like I, every morning I read uh, about industrial markets all over the world, which is just weird. I don't think that there's many people that do that. Uh, I come, I love coming on podcasts. I, I legitimately love talking to guys like you, Ola, uh, and it, it gets me like really excited. I think that's that's weird. I have my own uh, podcast show and my own YouTube channel. I think that that's weird as well. But I I embrace the weirdness. I I think that uh, doing things a little bit different is uh, is fun. Well, that makes both of us weird because I enjoy um, <laughs> talking to guys like you on Talking Shop as well. Next question. Um, what was the last book that you read? And what was the one thing you picked up from that book? Or it could be one of your reports too. <laughs> yeah, I'm reading a book called Blood and Oil right now, uh, which is about Saudi Arabia and uh, Mohammed bin Salman. And uh, it's, it's actually really interesting. And, and part of that, again, just me being 
uh, kind of a nerd or, or weird is that I like reading about other markets. So Saudi Arabia is a massive oil and gas market. And I just wanted to get a better background on, on the, the Royal family there and the history and why things got, and it's, it's really interesting. It's written by a, by a really good author. I don't remember his name offhand, but it's just, it's a very well-written book and it just tells a captivating story. Interesting. Fascinating. Final question. You're busy. What do you do for fun? Uh, I, well, I try to spend time with my family as much as I can uh, when I'm not working. And being in Canada, it's cold in the winters. It's nice in the summers, but it's cold in the winters. So I, I think having a, a good winter activity is really good for uh, uh, getting that, that factor out of your mind about it being so cold for so long. So we ski and snowboard quite a bit. So uh, any given time, we'll, we'll probably try and go uh, skiing or snowboarding every, every other day. Fantastic. If there's somebody listening to this and go, well, I really like, you know, Chad, I want to get connected to Chad. What's the best place people can reach out and get to find out um, and know more about you? Yeah, my YouTube channel would be awesome if someone wants to go in and check that out. So if you just search my name, uh, Chad Griffiths, or even just search industrial real estate, I'm really the only one that's talking on, on a regular basis. And uh, if you like the video, I'd greatly appreciate you uh, liking it or reached out to me. Uh, my emails uh, on there as well as as well as my LinkedIn, but uh, YouTube would be great if you could check that out. Fantastic. Chad, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Ola. Really appreciate it. Great questions as well. Love chatting with you.